I will get started here. So um, we have a very special program today. Um, I personally have been looking forward to this one for quite a while because our volunteer researcher who is giving our presentation today has been working on this research for um, quite a chunk of time this fall and winter. We've been discovering a lot of things about um, this subject for today. So um, looking forward to our presentation by uh, our volunteer, our award-winning volunteer, Frank Fiorito. So uh, with that in mind, I think I will pass over the microphone to him. The Oak Park Police estimated the crowd at about 200. Then the singing started. Now what, asked the neighbors? This would be a Christmas Eve unlike any other. The strange events that took place in front of the Kyler Avenue home of Dorothy and Harold Martin in December of 1954 weren't reported in the Oak Park Press, but had ample coverage around the country and world. Perhaps what happened here was too controversial for the conservative Oak Park of the 1950s. After all, they involved communication with the spirit world, flying saucers, and a group of believers so committed that they risked relationships, careers, and financial ruin. Anticipation is a word that well applies to this time of year. It is a looking forward to something good. We anticipate the gathering of friends and family at holiday parties and the start of a new year. Children anticipate the arrival of Santa Claus. Apprehension is a word that also describes looking forward, but with dread of what might be coming. The years since the end of World War II had been worrisome with the dawning of the atomic age and start of the Cold War. What would 1955 bring? That December, the group gathered at the Martin House were experiencing both apprehension and anticipation. Apprehension about a rapidly approaching catastrophe, a flood prophesized to end life on earth in anticipation of timely rescue by intelligent and compassionate beings, aliens who would take them to safety on the mysterious planet Clarion via flying saucer. These believers included a middle-aged Oak Park grandmother named Dorothy Martin, a Michigan State University staff physician named Charles Laffet, and a small group of followers. By 1954, the Martins had already been living at 707 South Kyler for a few years. Dorothy was a lady in her 50s. She wore her dark hair in a tight bun and was pleasant enough, but you had to be careful when getting into a conversation with her unless you were open to some very unusual perspectives. The first inkling of the neighbor, that the neighbors had of something unusual happening in the Martin household came in July. The chatter across backyard fences certainly increased when the oak leaves reported that Dorothy had been hosting Mr. Truman Betherum while he was in town to promote his book, Aboard a Flying Saucer. This visit would start a wild six months. Dorothy Lilly was born in West Virginia. Her first marriage resulted in the birth of a daughter, Marie. Harold Martin was born in Missouri. His first marriage resulted in the birth of a son, David. It's not clear why both Dorothy and Harold's first marriages ended, but their children, Marie and David, became acquainted with each other and married on December 21st, 1939. Dorothy and Harold married on April 15th, 1941. By the 1950s, Dorothy and Harold were living on Kyler Avenue across the street from Longfellow School. The 1950s were anxious times. The Russians had successfully tested a hydrogen bomb in 1953, but in 1954, the US tested its first weaponized H-bomb, one that could be loaded in an airplane and dropped over a target. The means of destroying all civilization was now available. Anxious times lead people to look for hope wherever they can find it. On June 24th, 1947, businessman Kenneth Arnold piloting his private plane near Mount Rainier in Washington state saw some unexplained objects flying at a high rate of speed. He described the objects as saucer like The next day, the Chicago Sun newspaper ran the story of his sighting 
along with the headline, Supersonic Flying Saucers Sighted by Idaho Pilot. A new term was introduced into the public consciousness, flying saucer. <coughs> Soon America and the world was abuzz with excitement about visitors from another planet or aliens. Across the country, newly formed flying saucer clubs attracted many members. Books like Flying Saucers Have Landed and movies like The Day the Earth Stood Still fanned the excitement. Even toy makers cashed in on the phenomenon. Dorothy was fascinated by flying saucers, outer space, and the existence of aliens. That fascination only increased when she became endowed with powers of extrasensory perception. Awakening before dawn one morning in early 1954, Dorothy felt a tingling in her arm. She felt that someone was trying to make her arm move. Calming herself, she let the movement take place. Pen in hand, she began to write out a message. It was from her father, who had died four years earlier. The message itself only consisted of instructions on planting flowers. But this, her first experience of automatic writing, was life-changing. It would provide her with the means of communicating with the spirit world and eventually aliens. As she developed her ESP skills, her contacts with the spirit world increased. One spirit in particular identified himself as elder brother. He encouraged and assured her that she was to be the means the spirit world would communicate with the mortal world. Okay. Earth was, uh, let's see here. There we go. Earth was being watched over by benevolent beings. Dorothy referred to these as the guardians. One of these identified himself as Sananda. He became an important source of information for Dorothy, revealing himself to her as the contemporary identity of Jesus. Receiving messages from outer space clearly differentiated Dorothy from others attending talks at Flying Saucer Club meetings. These meetings often had a guest speaker, most often an expert on flying saucers. At one meeting, Dorothy introduced herself to the speaker who was impressed enough that he mentioned her to Dr. Charles Lafet and his wife Lillian, who were fellow flying saucer enthusiasts. This introduction would begin the Lafet's regular correspondence with Dorothy and frequent trips from their home in Michigan to visit her in Oak Park. Charles A. Lafet and Lillian Sandy were married while he was completing medical school. Before Charles accepted a job as a staff physician in student health services at Michigan State University in East Lansing, they both had served as missionaries in Egypt. Meeting Dorothy, a person with the ability to make contact with the spirit world, was life-changing. By July of 1954, Dorothy was now receiving messages from the Guardians on a daily basis. One message received in late July was that on August 1st, a flying saucer would land at a nearby airfield. Excited to see their first flying saucer, the Lawfeds didn't hesitate to make the four-hour trip from Michigan to witness this momentous event with Dorothy. At first, there was disappointment when no flying saucer arrived, but Dorothy and the Lawheads were convinced that something had happened. They just couldn't say what. Starting the next day, and continuing through the month, Dorothy began receiving numerous messages from Sananda, each more ominous than the net last. A disaster was coming. There would be an upheaval of Earth's surface, causing the waters of the Great Lakes to overflow and cover the central part of the continent with water from the Arctic Circle to the Gulf of Mexico. This flood was coming and many would perish, but those who believed would be rescued. The messages from Sananda were so dire that Dr. Lafed sent word to the press to give the world some warning. Readers scoffed, some ridiculed, but many sought out Dorothy to discuss her views on flying saucers and aliens. The children who attended Longfellow School across the street wanted to hear more about outer space and flying saucers. Parents, School authorities and the police were less enthusiastic. They threatened her with psychiatric examination unless she stopped her contact with the children. 
fearful of being committed, Dorothy stopped meeting with the children, but regretted that they would be unable to continue to learn from her. In Michigan, Dr. Lafed had been leading discussion groups with some university students. Their group called itself the Seekers, and what started as discussions about the occult and spiritual practices became a regular meeting on flying saucers in outer space. His press release brought him to the attention of the school administration, and he was asked to resign his position. He had staked his career on his belief in Dorothy's revelations. The day after his termination, he and his wife Lillian traveled to Oak Park to join Dorothy and get orders from the guardians. Dr. Leon Festinger at the University of Minnesota was researching how people with strongly held beliefs dealt with the mental conflict that came when those beliefs were challenged by contradictory information. He noted that a man with a conviction is a hard man to change. Tell him you disagree and he turns away. Show him facts and figures and he questions your sources. Appeal to logic and he fails to see your point. People reject explain away or avoid information that conflicts with what they believe or assume to be correct. When the Minnesota, Minneapolis Star Tribune published Dr. Lawfed's press release, Festinger and his colleagues realized Dorothy Martin and Charles Lawfed had presented them with a perfect case study as they developed what we now know as the theory of cognitive dissonance. We know the details of what happened in Oak Park that December because both Dorothy's and Lafed's groups had been infiltrated by researchers. In 1956, their observations were reported in the book, When Prophecy Fails. Once the word was out about Dorothy's contacts with outer space, activity picked up at the Martin home. A growing number of followers were calling on Dorothy and by November, meetings at her house seemed to be a daily occurrence. Many meetings would begin after 9 p.m. and run until dawn. The once quiet neighborhood was now subjected to activity at all hours. Things really got interesting after midnight on December 18th. That day, someone looking into the Martin's backyard would have seen a group of people standing in the cold and snow, looking up to the sky, waiting for something. They were waiting to be picked up by a flying saucer, waiting and waiting until well after 3 a.m. How could the neighbors not notice? The guardians had assured the group that they would not be left behind to perish in the flood, but must be ready at a moment's notice for the arrival of a flying saucer. They warned that on board a flying saucer, contact with metal would burn the skin. To remain constantly prepared for rescue, the group made sure they had absolutely no metal on them. They ripped the zippers out of their trousers. Belts were discarded in favor of rope tied around the waist. Plans were made to quickly discard eyeglasses with metal frames or shoes that might have metal heel taps before entering a flying saucer. Activity at the house increased even more as the prophesized flood date approached. On Monday, December 20th, Dorothy received updated orders. At exactly midnight, December 21st, the group would be placed in parked cars and taken to a place where they would be put on a flying saucer. Spirits soared, rescue was on the way. The rescue would proceed like this. At precisely midnight, a spaceman would come to the Martin home and escort them to the flying saucer. He would knock on the door and before entering would wait for them to say the password which was, what is your question? 19 years older than Dorothy, the 73-year-old Harold E. Martin had experienced enough excitement in his life. When married to his first wife, he had lived in Waukegan, Illinois, working as a banker. His banking career ended in 1927 when he was indicted for bank fraud. While he was acquitted of all charges, the trial attracted national attention and undoubtedly extracted a toll. Wanting no more publicity in his life, as Dorothy and the believers prepared to be taken to Clarion, he retired to his bedroom in the back of the house and went to bed. In 
At 11.15 p.m., the group of 15 believers put on their overcoats and gathered in the front room awaiting midnight. The hour had two clocks ticking away the minutes. One ran about five minutes fast, and this one chimed the hour first. Now attention was on the second clock. As it approached midnight, Dorothy shouted out, and not a plan has gone astray. The second clock struck 12, and the group sat in silence. There was no knock at the door. They hadn't been rescued, and the dawn of December 21st approached. Would they be swept away in the flood after all? Then Dorothy received another message. She could barely contain her joy as she told the group that because of their deep belief, the foretold destruction had been called off. By their faith, they had saved the world. Happy for the miracle that occurred, had occurred, Dorothy and Charles still looked forward some sign that while there was no flood, some part of the prophecy had happened. <coughs> when the newspapers reported about an earthquake in California, Dorothy and Charles felt justified. Something indeed had happened. While relieved that the flood would not take place, there was disappointment about missing the opportunity to travel on a flying saucer. Still, this was to be a joyous time. Dorothy received a new message with instructions that at 6 p.m. on December 24th, the group was to assemble outside the Mount Martin House to sing Christmas carols. They would be visited by spacemen who definitely would arrive by flying saucer. This was to be a celebration, and the group was specifically told to invite the public. So on Christmas Eve, precisely at 6 p.m., Dorothy's group and a group of 200 boisterous onlookers stood in front of 707 South Kyler to sing while awaiting the spacemen. The singing went on for a while, but after 20 minutes and no obvious visit by spacemen, the singers went back inside. When interviewed by a reporter afterward, Dr. Loffett suggested that he may have seen one spaceman in the crowd or that spaceman may have been there, but in disguise, or that the boisterous crowd led them to change their plans to avoid causing a riot. As the events of December unfolded, Dr. Loffett's sister had taken steps to have him declared mentally ill. He submitted to a court-ordered psychiatric examination. It was pronounced sane, but mistaken. The Christmas Eve event was the last straw. The police told Harold that either Dorothy would seek out psychiatric help or she would be charged with inciting a riot, referring to the, the mob attracted on Christmas Eve, and contributing to the delinquency of minors because Dorothy's talk about space travel made some children so upset they couldn't sleep. The last thing the police wanted to do was serve a warrant and prolong this very time consuming episode. They just wanted the issue to end. And it did end. On December 26, Dr. Lawford and his wife and three children went back to East Lansing, put their house on the market and headed out of town eventually settling in Arizona. He gave up the practice of medicine to devote full time to lecturing about flying saucers and aliens. He died in 1980. There are contradictory reports regarding Dorothy's whereabouts after that night. The most often repeated is that she headed to Peru to study with a community called the Brotherhood of the Southern Rays. In 1961, she surfaced in Arizona referring to herself as Sister Thedra. And in 1965, she moved on to Mount Shasta, California, where she established the Association of Sananda and Sanat Kumara. In 1988, she and her community moved to Sedona, Arizona. Sister Thedra's many writings are still in print. Dorothy Martin died in 1992. Along with other homes on the block, 707 South Kyla was acquired by the school district and is now a playground area for Longfellow School. Oak Park witnessed these events observed and recorded by Dr. Festinger and his researchers. 
What happened on Kyler Avenue that December provided case study support to validate the theory of cognitive dissonance. Our daily life is filled with countless examples of the theory at work. We see it in the behavior of others and we see it in ourselves. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. So I, I'll have you stay right there. Here. Okay. And I'll invite everybody to um, send in your questions if you want to put those in the chat box, if you have any questions for Frank or comments. Um, but at this time, I do want to say that we have somebody on the call who reached out to me and said that she was actually in the crowd. Um, I believe on Christmas Eve when uh, these folks were gathering in front of the house on Kyler. So Deborah, if you feel like you want to turn on your speaker and, and share some of your memories of that event, I would love to hear that. Hi, yeah, I, we lived at 624 South Kyler, right across from Longfellow Park in the middle of the block. And I don't recall it being Christmas Eve. I may have gone on a different day. I think as a child, I was, uh, it had just turned five. And my birthday was in November. So this was quite a, a long time back. But I remember going down the block and my mother telling us um, that there was a woman on the roof. She said, I recall her saying it was on the roof of the house. And um, she was waiting for the Martians to come and take her. That's, you know, from the, she called it Martians at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, I went down there and I had just gotten a, a duck that summer, um, oh. a little baby duck. And it was, it had grown up and we were about to give it to Trailside Museum. But I remember crossing um, at the corner, uh, crossing Jackson Boulevard and there were uh, TV stations and, photographers and everybody there, a lot of people. And I crossed the, the street and all these cameras went on me with this duck following me. I had a duck following me all the way down the block. Donald was his name, very clever. But I, I just remember us standing there and talking about it. Um, I had just been a kindergartner at Longfellow School. I started when I was four. And I don't recall it, anything going on in the school, but um, and I don't recall being upset by it, but we waited and nothing happened and it went back, we went back home and that was it. So, but it was, it was kind of a thing that you have in the back of your mind. And at that age, you know, you don't recall everything clearly, but I just remember a lot of people, we had a, a, a Ray, the policeman who was our crossing guard. He helped us across the street um, on Jackson Boulevard there. And there was a little delicatessen on the corner, but it was on that side of the block. And when, when I saw that written, I thought, my gosh, that must have been the thing I went to. So it, it jogged my memory quite a bit. Oh my gosh, how wild. What? So I never was, uh, that, um, I didn't have any nightmares or anything. We're probably in the film footage that they were taking for, for the news reels and everything. And yeah. um, once you said that, uh, Frank and I the other day were looking at some of the photos that you were mm -hmm. finding in all of these different publications, and we were looking for you and your duck. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, my duck. Didn't see any, but there's got to be some footage somewhere. Of that. Someplace, yes. So, what other like publications were you looking through? Because you, we, we saw a lot um, of headlines that you were finding, mm -hmm. but it was kind of covered all over the place. It, it was, and. Um, I'll take this off again. One uh, of the best photos um, was of uh, Dorothy and the crowd. Um, it was published in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. And um, it, there's a, um, uh, I want to say a couple of years ago, one of the uh, editorial writers for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch uh, published an online uh, article about uh, the event and uh, or the issues around the event, basically cognitive dissonance and, and uh, current events, if you will, and had a nice photograph um, that is owned by the Associated Press and so <laughs> <laughs> controlled very tightly by them. Um, one of the photos in here is uh, of uh, Dorothy and Dr. Uh, Lawhead um, in the house and that 
um, is from an episode of, of, excuse me, an edition of Life Magazine, which is available if you uh, search online, you should be able to find that, that issue. And, and it has, you know, like a, a recap of various things that happened in 1954. And that's one of the pictures. Um, the rest of the pictures that uh, I was able to find uh, were from newspaper articles and, um, and basically just newspaper clippings. Um, and um, uh, it just was so widely covered uh, that that was uh, uh, picked up by many, many newspapers throughout the country and even in Canada. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it was uh, interesting to see the coverage, uh, whether it was just a mention or if it was a full blown article, uh, probably dependent on uh, what, what else was going on in the news that day. When you said um, that it wasn't covered so much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Deborah, for sharing. This is wonderful to hear. And thank you, Frank, for, for sharing and for all of the research that you put into this. Um, very careful, very thorough research. And um, it's obviously a topic that has, has come up in different ways in, in recent times. And I think it's, it's wonderful to, to study. And to know that this sort of thing was um, a, a topic of discussion in Oak Park, even at this point in time. So it's fascinating to, to hear and to have you share. You're welcome. I enjoyed it. So I think with that, I will have us all sign off for today. Um, and I want to wish us all a happy holiday season. And um, I will invite you to look at our website for future programs like this. Um, we'll be back in January and um, looking forward to continuing online uh, programs in 2022 and um, hopefully some things in person as well. And um, very happy to have you all here. So thank you very much. And I will see you again soon.